half in the bag. I can't stop pooping in my pants. Hello and welcome to Half in the Bag. I'm Jay. And I'm Mike. And it's been a little while since our last episode. Uh, the last film we discussed on Half in the Bag was Annabelle Creation. That's right, Jay. And one of the bigger things brought up in that episode was the contest associated with the movie. It was called My Annabelle Creation. That's right, Mike. And since then, there's been some major updates. That's right. They've announced the winner of the contest. His name is Stephen King and he's from Maine. And his idea was called It. Since then, Warner Brothers has made a feature film from his submission, and they've compensated him $100. Congratulations, Stephen, on your spooky idea. And Warner Brothers thanks you for your submission. They especially love the part where there's just lots of loud banging noises every time something scary is supposed to be happening. By the way, whatever happened to David F. Sandberg? It seems he disappeared from existence once people started asking him about the sketchy contest. Tuesday night, it's 30 years later. I'm right on schedule. The killing start up again. Six so far, maybe more. It's that, and it's mad. Take your pick, Bert. Billy boy. Something bad's going to happen to one of us. Get out of Derry while you still can. I'm going back in. This time I'm going to kill it. Something's coming. The thrilling conclusion of Stephen King's It, Tuesday Night. I did not realize how beloved this TV movie was until the promotional material for the new one started to come out. The first trailer for the new It came out and it was like the most viewed trailer in one day in the history of YouTube or something like that. So it's like, a, like it is like a beloved property. And there were a number of Stephen King TV movie adaptations made in the late 80s, early 90s. And every single one of them sucks, including it. And everybody has forgot all of the other ones. The Langoliers, Tommyknockers, The Golden Years. But yeah, I think the only reason that one is kind of remembered fondly is uh, because people kind of our age saw it when they were 10, 11, 12 years old and thought it was spooky. And the only reason it holds up in anyone's mind is because of Tim Curry as Pennywise. Won't do any good to run, girly boy. <laughs> See you in your dreams. Oh, come back anytime. Bring your friends. Uh, but, so we're going to talk about the TV movie first. And it'll be hard not to dip back and forth. And we'll probably talk a little bit about the book too. Um, I've been in the process of rereading the book. I was hoping to have it done before the new movie came out, but I think that's physically impossible because the book is, is this fucking big. Uh, there's actually no uh, documentation of anyone ever finishing this book before they die. I finished the book. Uh, full disclosure, I read the whole thing in high school. In high school? Okay. I did, I did. I read um, it when I was younger, shortly after the TV movie. I was too young to understand it. And then yeah. I've, I've been in the process of rereading it um, in anticipation of the new movie. Yeah. It was a number of years after the movie came out, but someone, a friend of mine was reading it, and he's like, you should read this. And I was like, oh yeah, okay. And I read it. I don't remember anything about it other than what everybody else remembers from it. Spooky clown and uh, underage gangbang. Underage. Gang bang. And just to get it out of the way right up front, no, that scene is not in the new movie. Let's get all this out of the way right off the bat. For me, it is a mixed bag. It feels like 25 different ideas that aren't quite completed. Welcome to the world of Stephen King. Yeah, he, I think he's just, <laughs> he yeah. just writes like, and he's like a weird sex pervert, and he <laughs> writes like bizarre things, and his, some of his dialogue's weird, but then some things are brilliant, yeah. and then some things aren't, and they're weird, and, he, and I'll shove this in there, and, and he just like goes crazy on a typewriter, and nobody stops him, and then he releases <laughs> a 7,000 page book. <laughs> And it's like, here, make some sense of this. Yeah. Well, it's unique uh, amongst his books because he writes pretty quickly, from what I understand. He'll like, kind of like, like, like John Hughes type. Like John Hughes would write a feature-length screenplay in a weekend, and it would be wonderful. Uh, and Stephen King's kind of that same way, where he's just like constantly writing things. But he spent like four years on it. This was like, before The Dark Tower, this was like his kind of Lord of the Rings or something. So it's, it's, uh, 
it's messy, it's big, it's the storytelling is all over the place. Uh, not something you can make into a conventional feature film. Uh, the, the TV movie kind of tried, and the new movie tried, and we'll get into that as far as the, the narrative structure yeah. uh, of the new movie, which is different than the structure of the, the original TV movie or the book. Um, and I'm assuming if you're watching this, you probably saw the TV movie. Everybody's seen the TV movie. Uh, it play- and if you haven't, you're probably not going to get much out of it, because it does not hold up. The first half holds up of the TV movie, since we're talking about that now. The second half is a disaster. <laughs> um, it's, it's an embarrassing disaster, but the first part holds up, and this new movie is just the kids. Yes. And at the end it says, chapter one. And then some asshole, two rows behind me, went, I knew it, I knew it. They gotta do the adults. They gotta do the adults. Oh well, like, yeah. What the fuck? <laughs> Are you dense? (laughs) Yeah, we remember, dude. We all saw the TV movie, too. You're not the only one. Do you think he thought that the the movie was just going to continue and it was going to be like six hours long? Uh, Yeah, I I don't know. I think he thought he was the only one who was in the know (laughs) about the part with the adults. Well, that's like the people, whenever you mention the book, everybody is always like, did you know? There's a scene with an underage gangbang. Everybody likes to point that out as if they're the only one that knows about it. Yeah, um, for those of you who haven't read the book, can we elaborate on the underage gangbang? <laughs> when they're down in the, in, the, in, in the sewers at the end of the film, uh, or in the end of the book, uh, I think they all say, they, they get lost, and they say the only way we can find our way out is we all have to lose our virginity and have sex with Bev. And then Bev's like, okay, and then, and then it's like it's like each one she, she is describing like how their penises felt. And the, yeah, she talks about how big Ben is, the fat kid. It right. goes into detail. Yeah, that she doesn't in, even know if it'll fit in. The 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 key words are it goes into detail. <laughs> and that's when I look at Stephen King and I could just see his face in a police mugshot for <laughs> for sex pervert. Because I'm like, what is this? Yeah. What is this? I, so, and that, that is, though, that is though the, the mark of genius, in a way, is that bordering on insanity. Sure. Well, who else would think to put that in there? So it is both entertaining and frustrating because it's, it's like I said, a mixed bag. Well, the, the TV movie, it, it's a, a fairly uh, accurate adaptation of the book. It's more notable uh, for what, what is in the book is in the TV movie, but there's just way more in the book that is not in the TV movie. Mo- almost everything that's in the TV movie is l- literally what's in the book okay. as far as the basic things that happen. Yeah. But the book, of course, elaborates a lot more on all the backstory and the motivations and what's going through people's minds. All the stuff that makes it interesting to read. Uh, that's all gone from the TV movie. And all you're left with is Harry Anderson making terrible jokes. Boy, that matches your real hair. Has anyone ever told you? Anyone from out of town? And lots and lots of bad acting by the adults. Oh, yes. Yeah. Some, some <laughs> scenes are painfully uncomfortable. Yes. We have to talk about the uh, why is it so mean scene with uh, Annette O'Toole and the late, great John Ritter. Why is it doing this? Why does it hate? Why is it so mean? It's like something out of a shitty soap opera. At least you felt something. That's a miracle too. Your hair is winter fire. Why'd you say that? You wrote it, didn't you? When I was young, I thought it was Bill, but it was you, wasn't it? Damn it, Bev, is that you in there? Is that the clown? Well, Stephen (laughs) King's dialogue is often bad and kind of dated and weird. It, yeah, sometimes it sounds like something out of like the 50s or something, which which works when you have these little kids that are actually in the 50s, but um, when they're adults in the 80s, it sounds weird. True, but then we come to the point of it, um, and then it becomes sort of like a little confusing. Uh, it, has, it has some similarities to Freddy Krueger, Nightmare on Elm Street, where there's like uh, playing on your fears. Yes. Um, it, it, if you're scared of uh, 
the Wolfman from the Wolfman movie, which was in the TV movie and in the book, but not in this version. Uh, uh, the wolf, it'll, it will appear as the Wolfman. Well, the original idea for the book, his idea, Stephen King's idea, was to kind of make it like a monster mash, like fill it with like, I love the mummy and I love the Wolfman, and to kind of put them all in there. Everybody thinks of it as being about the clown, mm -hmm. um, but it, it takes on all these other forms. He's very ineffective in the TV movie. He's, his whole existence is to eat children, but he's just constantly letting them go. Uh, you, you don't want to just you, you don't want to apply logic to to a, a story like this. Um, that's why I was thinking Nightmare on Elm Street when comparing it to this, because Nightmare on Elm Street there is that there is that hard line between Freddy Krueger. He can get you in your dreams, but not when you're awake. Yes. It it sort of blur, it sort of blurs that line. Yeah. Eh, I can kind of get you. I can't. Eh. And every nightmare you ever had, I am your worst dream come true. I'm everything you ever were afraid of. So, sometimes Freddy might try and kill you, but you wake up just in time, and then he can't get you. Yes. Here in the TV movie, especially more so than even the book, is like yeah. Richie Tozier, I'm a werewolf man, and I got you, and then I'm just gonna let you run away. Yeah. He does that over and over in the TV movie. And it is, it appears as a clown, or it appears as your worst fear to, to, I guess, lure children in to eat it, but why would it appear as something scary if it's gonna lure you in? Well, it's kind of the opposite of the new movie, in that he, in the TV movie, he lures you in as the clown, and then he, like, turns into a creepy monster. Yeah. In the, t in the new movie, he's usually a creepy monster first, and then they look back, and then he's the clown, which is sort of weird. The, the, the it is, is a space alien, uh, apparently. We don't know. It's, a, it's a cosmic entity. Cosmic uh, entity. There was, you see, there's this, this cosmic space turtle that, that vomits up our galaxy. Uh, he's from the Macroverse, it's called. And then uh, the, he's sort of the, the, the good figure, and then it comes from, it's like the negative kind of counterbalance to that. It somehow crash lands centuries ago, it crash lands in Derry. And now this, this evil force is stuck on Earth in Derry. And so every 27 years, it wakes up and feeds. Pretty fucking weird stuff. Uh, I think the co-author of the book is Cocaine. And uh, it, these are things that were left out of both the TV movie and, at least so far, the, the new movie. I don't know what the second part will be, but... There's several references to turtles. There are, the but they were... We're going to talk were... about that in part two of this fucking episode. In chapter two. But yeah, so the idea is that the, the losers, the little kids that are all losers, all form a little team. They're stronger in a group, and their, their strength together is what uh, it ultimately defeats the it. They, they momentarily, until it comes back as their adults, it's the, the, the bond and strength of their friendship that makes them strong and not scared anymore. Which is kind of like Freddy Krueger as well. I take back every bit of energy I gave you. You're nothing. You're shit. Yeah, the, the, let's talk about the end of part one. And part one is uh, little kids, and they, they think there's a, there's a theme with the werewolf, and they think silver bullet. That's just stuff in movies. I mean, what good's it gonna do They're against silver? They can kill it. Believe, Stanley, we have to. It all makes sense coming from the mind of a child. Uh, she hits it in the head, and, it, and its dead lights come out, and it shrinks down into the it, tube. It turns into a claymation Gumby man. Yes. And goes down into the sewer. So, yeah, that. that uh, then, then part two comes back. And everybody uh, just fucks around for two hours. And then they show up and they decide to go to a Chinese restaurant. It's all right. It's all right. Say it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Have a good time. Cause it's all right. I get the idea behind it. It's like, hey, we're going to have to deal with this evil entity just for tonight. We're all reunited. Let's, let's have a good time. But the, uh, uh, I don't know, the, the, the balance or the, the transition from one kind of tone to the other is completely absent. Yeah. yeah, the first half of the TV movie feels like a nice 1980s horror movie with kids in it. 
the Stand second by half. me with monsters. Stand by me with monsters. Well executed, well done. Some scary moments. The second half feels like like a soap opera. I feel the bond with the kids when they're kids. Yes. But when they all come back, it's like none of them can remember the it incident. Sort of they can, but then they're all like all kissing Bev on the mouth. <laughs> Like all of them, even though they have significant others. There was no underage gangbang in the in the TV movie. Right, and then um, and then it's like John Ritter is giving her like like a sensual neck massage with everybody just like he, staring at them. Yeah, well, the one guy's like he's taking his shoes off and he's like rubbing his feet, and they're all just like lounging around. <laughs> it's just, it's, I, I don't know if that's to be blamed on the direction. Like, okay, yeah, how about you guys? You guys are just sitting around and you want to, you're, you're comfortable, so. John, go over there and just start massaging her shoulders and and, uh, and start grabbing her knees and squeezing her. <laughs> and then you're rubbing your feet and you're picking your nose over there. And you, you know, you're, you, t- you, you take off your shirt and you're laying by the fireplace and you decide to oil up. <laughs> I, you know, it's like, what the fuck's going on? Yeah. And so it I has this unintentional sexual energy thing happening. Yes, and that, that is another big thing with it is weird sex stuff because at one point Eddie right before they enter its domain which is an adorable high school play set (laughs) little little styrofoam skulls and a cute little doorway it's a little more epic in this film (laughs) uh, in the new film but Eddie decides to tell everyone that he's a virgin I mean I've never even been with any Eddie Eddie what are you saying you're a virgin yeah well, I can't help you with that, pal, but thanks for sharing. And then Harry Anderson cracks jokes. His jokes are so bad, and they're so ill-timed and awful, but that's besides would it, the point. Would it shock you to learn that they were mostly improvised? Um, Get back to Night Court, you hack. So uh, 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 Eddie says, I- I've, I've never had sex before because I've only wanted to have sex with someone that I truly loved. And the only people that I've truly loved are the three of you here now. And, and I think he's proposing an orgy at the most inappropriate time. And then they kick open the door and it becomes a terrible, uh, <laughs> a terrible um, haunted house spider. Uh, it looks terrible. And I'm a fan of stop motion, but in the context of this, it comes across terrible. Low budget TV movie of the week stop motion yes. is not good stop motion. <laughs> <laughs> and this is uh, something that happens in the book. There is a giant spider. In the context of a book though, of course, it's kind of left up to your own sort of mind to yeah, interpret yeah. how it looks. Um, well, it's not supposed to be literally a spider. It's just the alien's true form, right? It's, it's, the thing has no form on earth. It has no physical form. And the spider is like the closest representation that our minds can comprehend. Gross and disgusting. Yeah, yeah. it's very sort of like, uh, like Lovecraftian kind of left to your imagination type thing. Um, but in the TV movie, it's just a big, stupid-looking rubber spider. And then they they just say, "Let's get it," and they push it over, and they rip its heart out. And I mean, that does literally happen in the book, but all the uh, kind of subtlety and motivation and, and explanation of what this thing is is completely gone. So all you're left with is uh, Harry Anderson punching a rubber spider. Again, it big, long, complex book with lots of things going on. Done on a 1990s TV movie budget. Yeah, and does not quite translate. They didn't even need that second half. And that was a smart thing for this movie to do. To yeah. not try and tackle all that. Yeah. Well, it's, it's also the structure is different. I mean, there's a little bit of cutting back and forth in the first half. Uh, we get scene after scene of someone picking up the phone and then awkward zoom in and then flashback. Mm-hmm. Uh, the book is going back and forth between kids and adults. They're pretty much the whole thing. Yeah. So you're seeing like them going into the sewers when they're adults, and then they have these recovered memories of when they were kids going into the sewer. Um, almost unfilmable as far as structure goes, as you know, if you tried to do something true to the book. So yeah. uh, I think they were smart with the TV movie to do it the way they did. Uh, but again, you lose some stuff in translation, and then this new movie just kind of functions as a standalone movie. Like you, you could not do the second half and it still would work. Mm-hmm. Up here, shop stuff. 
up here. You helped me once, remember? Well, we're back, and now we're going to talk about the new It film. We're going to jump ahead 27 years. 27 years. Which I should point out, it's been 27 years between the TV movie and now this new adaptation of It, which is kind of crazy. That is madness. And the timing is actually perfect. I was thinking about this while watching this because we saw the movie in a theater that was crowded, packed with people on a weekday night. Oh my gosh, I'm so used to seeing movies with, with three other people scattered around. And that's on a Saturday night. And that's on a Saturday night. So this movie is going to do real well financially. It's getting good reviews. Um, and it's, it's the perfect timing because uh, it takes place in 1989, um, obviously, so that the second chapter can take place in modern day. The first one took place in the, the kids' part was in the 50s, so in the 80s or some early 90s, whatever. But, um, so you have that retro 80s thing, which is popular now with Stranger Things. Yes. Uh, and the kid from Stranger Things is even in this. Yeah. So kids riding around on their bicycles. Which yeah, is- it's sort of weird, because like Stranger Things is sort of uh, homaging it, and now we have it that feels like it's aping off of Stranger Things. That's the thing now, <laughs> and. I'm all for movies coming back to having kids on bikes, yeah. going off and having adventures. And you have films like Annabelle Creation, uh, films with absolutely no plot, <laughs> just a series of scary things happening that you could put in a trailer that are mega successful. Yeah. So it, this new movie has a series of scary things happening with kind of story. <laughs> so by golly, it's gonna make it to a billion dollars. It's a perfect time and everybody loves creepy clowns. Creepy clowns all around. Well, not people that are clowns professionally. They're very upset about this movie. I don't know if you've heard about that. I have, I have. It's kind of ironic that clowns uh, are are taking this so seriously. I, I thought this movie was okay. Jay, elaborate. (laughs) Um, I, I'm very split on it. It was kind of a frustrating movie. Uh, as I've been rereading the book, and it gets a lot of things right. It changes some things, which we can probably get into, um, to, to make it work as kind of a conventionally sort of three-act structure movie. Uh, all the stuff with the kids, and the kids kind of uh, bonding and forming a friendship and becoming the Losers Club, wonderful. Almost all these kids are fantastic, and uh, you really believe them as these, these budding friends, uh, and all their performances are great. And then the stupid horror movie gets in the way, where every single scare moment is accompanied by a loud clang noise, and I hated it. Uh, uh, subtlety is not a word that's in the cinematic language of this film. And there were certain moments that I think actually could have worked as a, like a creepy horror movie moment if it just did not have that loud, obnoxious noise to let you know that this is where you're supposed to be scared. It parallels a lot with Annabelle creation because it's like, what happens now? I don't know, they run into the monster again and then it goes, woo, and then it goes away. Yeah. And, and so it became very like repetitive. And like you said, the, the kid's storyline um, worked, all that stuff worked. And then I, I thought uh, whatever Skarsgård was the clown did great. Yeah. Um, I, I thought that performance and a lot of the clown effects were neat, but I, w- I didn't, I, w- I wasn't scared at all during this movie. I was just kind of like, kind of getting bored. And then there were some comedic tonal things that I thought went a little too far. There, there was maybe a few too many like Richie Tozier kind of one-liners after something scary happens. I liked him a lot in the role. That was um, his character though. Yeah, I, I, there was a couple parts where it felt kind of out of place or unneeded. 
like uh, Eddie's mom, like. Oh God, she looked like she belonged in a John Waters movie. Yes. Um, e Eddie Kasprak, the hypochondriac, his his fat mom has like like a yeah. pink tracksuit and yeah. Well, she, just that when they show her at first, she's just wearing like a moo moo and she <laughs> she looks sort of disgusting and, and slimy and and I I like that. Yeah. Um, because he has like well, like Munchausen syndrome or something, right? <laughs> like like. You're oh you're sick you're sick yeah and um and I was like ooh the, the mom is like gross you know and they didn't cast her as like the you know, yeah like the the creepy old lady it was just like this gross fat lady yeah. and then then she shows up in a pacer <laughs> in like a tracksuit with this like weird like like necklace on and it's it, it's like comical it becomes yeah. comical and there's there's some moments like that I was at first happy that they left in a lot of. Uh, the vulgar Stephen King dialogue. Yes. The, the F word is flying all over. The other F word flies out, yes. which I was shocked to hear in, in a modern day film. In, in context, it's fine, but as so many people I think kind of ignore context now, but as this asshole bully in the 80s, like. Would use that word. Yeah. Um, and so I like that it got, and then some of the, the dialogue the kids are saying, they're like talking about like, fucking their sister and your mom. <laughs> just, yeah, especially Richie Tozier. Just lots of yeah. vulgar, horrible sex things. Aren't you guys coming in? Uh-uh. It's gray water. What the hell is gray water? It's basically piss and shit, so I'm just telling you. In the book, Eddie is, of course, you know, he's always worried about diseases and scared, and, and scared of that stuff, and so he sees a leper, and the leper creeps him out. And, and in the book, though, the leper is, like, offering, him, offering to give him a blowjob, which is kind of fucked up. But again, Stephen King plus cocaine equals it. Uh, he does not do that in this movie, but it chases him around accompanied by loud, obnoxious sound effects. That ruin the sequence, but he's in there. And then there's a couple new ones too that aren't in the book, like uh, Stan is Jewish and he's in the, he's like practicing for uh, uh, bar mitzvah. He's practicing for his bar mitzvah and he, it goes into the back room of the, the, the synagogue he's in and there's a painting on the wall and then the painting comes to life. Yeah, see, that seemed very specific. I, I couldn't remember if that was in the book or not. That, that's, I don't believe that's in the book. Um, but the, the leper is, the, the yeah. people that were burned alive, that's from the book. Mike's parents? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they, it's like they did, they did the fear stuff and then they, they always followed it with an appearance from the clown. Yeah. And I don't know... Again, if that's in the book or not, I don't remember. Some parts it is, some parts it isn't. Yeah. Um, well, that, that I mean, spoilers here from here on out. Um, that, to me, obviously, the ending, they, they tied it up with a bow nice and neat because uh, uh, the original, the, the TV movie ending, and I don't remember the book ending, uh, she shoots him in the head with the thing and the dead lights come out of his head and he goes down the thing. Yeah. In this, they're like, eh? We See, gotta fight I, it, and then it kind of like, I'm your fear, I'm gonna get you, I'm your fear, and all the fears come back. Yeah. And that, to me, structurally, from a movie perspective, made sense. They didn't kill it. Right. They just showed it, They each one of them overcame their own individual little fears and beat it up, and then it went and slithered away because it lost all its power because they were no longer scared. Sure. Structurally, it, it made, made sense. sense. I actually prefer the, uh, ending of the kids portion from the TV movie okay. because I feel like it had a, a stronger sense of that bond between the kids. I mean, that's the whole idea is that they're stronger together. And like uh, Bev shooting the, the silver, like that's not like that. It's not that, that something like that would literally kill it. It's more what that represents. Yeah. It's them working together. It's all boiled down. Eddie, Eddie you know, he has his uh, inhaler and he's like, this is battery acid. And it's more just like their kind of imagination and their working together kills it. In this movie, they go down the sewer and they have like no plan. And then they just start beating it with pipes. Like, eh. Yeah, well, they bring the... the Cow cattle killing gun. Yeah, but. which is, wasn't in the book. That was just the, something they introduced in the first part of the movie. Pays off in the end of the movie, but still, like, they kind of have that because uh, uh, Bill goes to shoot it with that at the end. And, and yeah. uh, Mike's like, oh, it's empty. And it doesn't matter that it's empty. It's more that he believes. And yeah. so, like, a part of his head shoots off. But that's it. Then they just beat it with pipes. Again, it's all nebulous. It's all, like, Fuck, here's a 9,000 page book, figure it out. <laughs> you know what I mean? And 
I think that that translates to the film. That's one of the reasons I, I really like this movie. I don't know. I, I don't know anyone who calls it like a like a masterpiece. No, the, it's the, very sloppy. It's a great premise, and I, I think this movie does a good job of executing what works about that premise. Yes, and leaving out the stuff that doesn't. Well, the the it it the book is like like a giant. I'm going to use a metaphor. It's like a giant stew pot, right? And the the movie knew to take out the meat and the potatoes sure. and the vegetables. Yeah. But in the book Stew Pot, there's meat, potatoes, vegetables. And gangbangs. And gangbangs. But there's also candy corn <laughs> and, 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 and Skittles, a, a piece of pizza, and, and an apple. Okay. And uh, what are some other foods that just do not go together? <laughs> but it's in a big pot. Sure. And so the movie knew, like, oh, here's a creepy clown, here's some kids, here's some kind of premise about overcoming your fears. Now let's have a bunch of scenes with a creepy clown, and we'll put it all in a trailer, and y'all come out and see it now. Yeah. Come on, y'all. Come on out and see this. It's got a creepy clown in it. It's gonna go boo. <laughs> I feel like in, in this version of the movie, as an adaptation, they could have gotten rid of a couple of those kids. Mike Hamlin is left with almost nothing to do in this version. That's something that's changed from the book. In the book, he's the one that sort of is interested in Derry's history. Yeah, right. He's the one that, that you know, is looking up you know, the, the history of the town and all the horrible things that have happened. And in this version, they give that job to Ben, the fat kid, who already has his little love triangle yeah, thing going yeah. on. Mike Hanlon disappears for like a good chunk of the right. middle of the movie. And then when he comes back in, I was like, oh, right. Yeah. And then he doesn't really have a lot to do. He's got the, the whatever that's called, the gun you shoot into animals' heads to kill them. But that's it. It's like, eh. Yeah. So I thought that was weird. You could probably just pull Mike Hanlon out completely and it wouldn't have made a difference. It's an adaptation. You can change things. I think in, in this version of the movie, it would have worked better with less kids. But Jay, you can't remove a character from a classic book that nobody's read. <laughs> a classic book that only uh, anyone remembers because of Tim Curry in a TV movie made in 1990? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> I can proudly say I actually fucking read it. <laughs> I've read it cover too. Cover to cover. Yeah. As confusing and terrible as it was. <laughs> uh, you know, what now? Space Turtle? <laughs> um... But that was so fucking long ago, I can't remember anything from it. So it's almost like I didn't read it. Sure. Um, although I do remember the underage gangbang. You know, I was thinking with Bev cutting her hair. Yeah. I, I, that's probably in the book. I don't know if this I is I don't think that's there. in the book. Um, but I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. Movie, uh, TV movie, uh, Bev's sink fills up with blood. And then I'm like, wait, wait a minute. Blood's gonna go everywhere, isn't it? It's gonna be to the nth degree. It was comical. And I was right. It's because, yeah, it, it's actually kind of creepy at first when like just hair starts to shoot yeah. up and is like tangling around her arm. It reminded me of like a Nightmare on Elm Street sequence or something. Um, but the voices then, in, the, in the drain were more spooky than that. Yeah, and that's the thing is like subtlety goes a long way in being creepy, but we gotta, everything's gotta be up, up to the, you know, so like blood shoots everywhere. And just like in the book, the kids all decide like, hey, parents either don't see this or pretend to not see this. We're gonna help you clean it up. And I'm, it's just like, it's all over the ceiling. It's all over every wall. The entire bathroom is covered in blood. So the idea of them cleaning it up just felt like silly. Yes, as yes. As opposed to, that, that's as not good as the TV movie is. Right. The amount of blood I think is fine for what it's supposed to be conveying. It would have taken seven hours to clean up that blood. Yeah. And there's like this this idea that the dad's gonna come home. Anyway. Richie Tozier is sitting outside keeping an eye out. It's yeah. like, was he out there overnight? I, I'm sure we've said it before, but a loud noise is not scary. <laughs> it's startling, it might make you jump, but it's gonna leave no lasting impacts. And that's, this movie is just sort of like a, you know, like a haunted house. Literally at one point, they go into the, the, the creepy old house that looks like no house in reality. It looks like a horror movie house. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, they open the one door and there's a creepy girl that's hanging from the ceiling, but her bottom half is missing. And she goes, Rah! and then they close it. And that's the room you go into in the haunted house.
silence is, is undervalued in these stupid horror movies. The creepiest movie I've seen in years that actually made like, gave me goosebumps and made my skin crawl multiple times is a movie called Lake Mungo from a few years ago. There's not a jump scare in the entire fucking thing. It's just quiet sounds and photos of creepy things. Hmm. And it's incredibly unsettling. But you won't get a movie like that released to a wide audience. No. The irony is that this 9,000 page novel can get boiled down to a handful of scenes with creepy clown that, that will satisfy today's lowbrow, low attention span audience. And that's the, the frustrating part, I think, with a couple tweaks and just not playing it so broad with the horror stuff. I think this really could have been something special. Mm. As it is, all the kids stuff, uh, it's nice to see uh, that adapted better than it was in the TV movie. I like the kids in the TV movie, but as far as um, the way they interact and even the performances and stuff, I, I really like all that in this movie. But it's just that horror stuff is just played so broadly. Well, it's the, it's the perfect, like I said, the perfect time, perfect place for this material to bring it back. If you brought it back 10 years ago, I don't know, but it, it kind of fits nicely into a little, a little spot. It's, it's, it, people like that broad horror stuff now. They like the, the loud jump scares. Loud jump and scares and, the, and the, the, like the Annabelle creation, that doll, that stupid fucking doll. <laughs> I'm more scared of the Raggedy Ann doll yeah. than I am well, that's, of, that's I'm the, so scary, look at me, I'm so scary. Yeah, and that's the I'm problem so is like these, these movies, they're not gonna hold up yeah. over time. I, and I, I mean, I, I just rewatched The Exorcist the other day and that's a movie that holds up, it's timeless because it's executed like it's a drama. It's not executed like a scary horror movie. And so it, it, there's a psychological element to it that this movie could have had. Uh, I'm curious what it would have been like if Kerry Fukunaga would have, would have done it because that first season of True Detective is wonderful. And I have a feeling that might have been what ultimately led to him leaving is that clash between the studio saying like, no, you gotta have the creepy jump scares and, and him wanting to do something a little more highbrow than that. I don't know, but that's my guess. Nope, but there's enough, there's enough creepy clowns sprinkled throughout this to keep the popcorn going masses entertained. It's almost like a, uh, there's a repetition to it where it's almost like, I don't know if it's like, I know at one point in one of the Friday the 13th sequels, the producers were saying like, you gotta have a kill every eight minutes. And this movie kind of has that feel like, you gotta have the clown jump out and make a loud noise every eight minutes. Yep, yep. It, it had that, that sort of uh, workman-like kind of feel to it. Yeah. The only part in this movie that legitimately kind of like, I think my hair raised on my arms was uh, when Ben is flipping through the, the town history book and every page it's like the same picture over and over, but it just gets closer every time. And just that final visual of, of just like a child's head in a tree. It exploded into a tree. Yeah. yeah, like that was creepy. But of course that's also accompanied by <laughs> Like it would have been just as uh, unsettling without that. Then also there's a sequence where they're looking at the film slides. Yeah. And then it kind of does the, the film slide, film projector takes over and then the mom's face kind of turns into Pennywise. And then it's like, then it would be like, like burns out or something. Great. Yeah. Instead, like Pennywise comes out of the wall and, and it's he's like, giant. Rah! He's and giant. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so you, you and I, I think, while I don't really like the source material, uh, I think it's, it's a clusterfuck of ideas from a crazy man. Well, this movie streamlines it. The movie streams, streamlines it as best it can. It takes all the things out of the pot to make a, make a nice meal for everybody. It adds a, uh, a, a bit near the end of the second act where the characters all get upset with each other and go their separate ways. Classic three act structure stuff where then they have to come back together. Everybody's at their low point. Yeah. It seems like the evil has won, but then Bev gets kidnapped. We gotta go save her. Which I didn't like that either, by the way. Her getting kidnapped. <laughs> Yeah, if, if Pennywise had a reason to lure them all in, but he didn't. Right. Well, and then she's like the strongest one, 
And they, they make a line about, like, he couldn't get her, he couldn't kill her because she's too strong. And it's like, oh, she's so strong, then how could he lure her in in the first place? He should, he get should. one of those pussy kids. Get Eddie Kasprak down there. should have kidnapped Eddie Kasprak. So as it is, it just feels like a lame damsel in distress thing. Like, eh. yeah, Eddie's, Eddie's mom could have been, oh, Eddie's gone. And then, and then, then they'd be like, we're going to go find him. Ma'am, the lady who just dissed us all and told us you couldn't, we couldn't see Eddie anymore, we're gonna go save him. Man. Nice little turnaround, and then sit your fat ass down, we're gonna go save your son. We know where he's at. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> um, I did appreciate the very end of the movie, we did not have our characters walk off into the sunset, everything's quiet. And then Pennywise <laughs> jumps out right at the screen. <laughs> Cut the credits. They didn't do that. I was so shocked. That was the only shocking thing in the movie. Got to get down with the sickness. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for Bagul to pop out at the screen, and they didn't do it. So kudos to them for that. Yeah, it just kind of ended. It's with the, the, the only moment of restraint in the entire fucking movie. Maybe, you know what? We, we didn't stay for the post credit, so. Oh, do you think they had a Marvel-esque? post credit Possibly. sequence, setting up the sequel. Like just a shot of the, the, the sewer, or whatever, the, the, the well. Oh yeah, and then whoops. Something, something like that. Or just the eyes light up. Yeah. As long as you don't do it right before the end credits start. Yeah. Movie get... proper was over, we left the fucking theater. We didn't <laughs> see stupid shit. <laughs> if, uh, if you finished the movie and you stayed past the end credits, tell us if there was stupid shit. Please. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's uh, kind of a neat idea, but very muddled and confusing and all over the place. The, 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 the ramblings of a crazy man turned into a terrible TV movie, <laughs> then re refined into a marketable movie. That's a, the perfect way to describe it. That yeah. will be successful, but seems to have some of what makes the book work but not all. I, I, I think structurally, like the screenplay for this is, is perfect for what this needs to be. It's really just the execution and the horror sequences being more obnoxious than scary. That's really what killed it for me because uh, everything else I thought, the cinematography was nice. Like, that's, sure, sure. Uh, it had, yeah, it had like kind of, a, I don't know, a richer look than a lot of modern movies have. It, it, everything uh, looks so generic now. Out of 100 people, Jay, you being included in this bunch, 99 will find the, the sped up screaming clown scary. You will be the one person who will find boring old pictures scary, <laughs> okay? So the bean counters and the producers who, who are making this know what they're doing. I, sure. I'm, I'm sorry to be so blunt. Wait, you're thinking about, I mean, if you're talking about it in terms of like making their money back on opening weekend, mm -hmm. but I don't, think this movie is going to be considered some sort of horror classic in 25 years or anything. There, there were many, many dumb people in our theater. I just, I just sensed it. I have like <laughs> spidey senses. There, there were people walking in with pizzas and, and, and hot dogs and corn dogs. And uh, there was like, there was like wheelbarrows filled with like, <laughs> like garbage food and, and, and fatso's going, smoky clouds scare me. <laughs> you know, you know what I mean? And that, that's what this is. Yeah. I wish I could say, I wish I could be outraged that this brilliant novel was, was, you know, downplayed into spooky clown sequences but I'm not the biggest fan of the novel from the beginning, so all of this is just a big, big pile of trash <laughs> that I'm just digging my way through. Just throwing trash around. See, it's frustrating to me as, I, like, I have issues with the book, but I think the concept is great, and I think this could have been something special. I don't know. It's, just... it's no friend request. Now that's horror. Unfriend, and it won't let me unfriend the ghost. I'm friends with the ghost on Facebook. <laughs>
<laughs> Why isn't that the title of the movie? I'm friends, I'm with, friends with a ghost on Facebook. What do you want from me? I just want to be friends, Laura. Best friends. <laughs> they need to make it more clear so that people understand what they're supposed to be scared of. Life is a nightmare. <laughs> Just keep hitting us with hurricanes until we're all gone. Just come on, keep coming. <laughs> Harvey, Irma. Why doesn't Hollywood get hit by hurricanes? <laughs> Why is it America's armpit, Florida, that always gets hit by the hurricanes? Just hit, keep hurricanes go over, go over by the Pacific side. And run over Hollywood constantly with hurricanes, <laughs> one after the other, <laughs> until it's nothing just but a pile of debris and rubble. One after the other, after the other, constantly hitting Hollywood over and over and over again. So they stop making movies. I just want to be friends, Laura. Thank you and good night. Thank you.